Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. We are so glad that you have joined us today. Today's devotional will be brought to us by our production manager here at Blue Mountain Television, Daniel Biggs. Daniel, welcome to Daily Bread. I'm glad to be here. I think this is your first time. It is my first time. Well, we're glad that you are here. <laughs> and we want to, before we begin, open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your precious word that you have given us. And as we open and take a look at its pages, I pray that your spirit will be with us, guide us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the first chapter of Great Controversy, we are told about an event that foreshadows end-time events. In this key chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem, the spirit of prophecy explains the mechanism involved in the execution of God's wrath upon Jerusalem. Here are some revealing statements. The Jews have forged their own fetters. They had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. They were reaping what they had sown, and they had in fact destroyed themselves and had fallen by their own iniquity. On page 35 comes a very crucial statement. Their sufferings are often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. Now the very next statement that is made is even more revealing. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. In other words, the spirit of prophecy is here making it plain that there is need to understand that it is sin that separates us from God. Otherwise, our conclusions would conceal the work of Satan. Then in the very next sentence, the mechanism is explained. By stubborn rejection of the divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. On page 36 of Great Controversy now pauses to make a general application of the withdrawal mechanism in something we dimly comprehend. Here it is. We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering in holding in check the cruel malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand toward the sinner as the executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. Every, lay, uh, excuse me, every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Now hear this. God says in Deuteronomy 31, 17, says, I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Here is another clear revelation of what happens to those who reject God. In Numbers 21, 6, here is a scripture that plainly states, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now, looking upon line upon line, precept upon precept, to decode the language in the Bible, we must ask, is this in harmony with God's character and His law? Now, God is absolutely consistent. So, in, for a helping hand, let us get some help from the Book of Patriarchs and Prophets on page 429. And notice this quote. This is very interesting. 
as the protecting hand of God was removed from Israel, great numbers of the people were attacked by these venomous creatures. End quote. Now, our fear should be in sin and leaving the fatherly care and protection God is giving us. How little do we acknowledge this? Once again, she says, we cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. God loves us and He protects us, yet will not force Himself if we desire to leave us. If we desire Him to leave us, excuse me. Now listen to the words of Job, and this is from Job 22, 15 to 17. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? God created the universe out of an agape love for the purpose of love. Therefore, He created free intelligences, free moral agents, because there can be no love without freedom of choice. In order to choose to love, a person must be capable of choosing not to love. There can be no love without risk. There, can, there cannot be freedom without risk. God always intended to run the universe by love, not by force. Oh. How I appreciate this great love, for this is what compels me to follow Christ. And here in Romans uh, 2, 4, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? In John 3, 16 and 17, a well-known verse, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God gave Him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, He gave Him to the fallen race. 1 John 2.2 2 says, and He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life that was His. He took upon Himself our sins. In Matthew 27, 46, we read, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried, My God, my God! Why hast thou forsaken me? And to understand the statement of the sin separating him from the Father, we read in Isaiah 59 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Is this not what killed Jesus? He was separated from his Father. Hear these words from Desire of Ages, page 693. But God suffered with His Son. Angels beheld the Savior's ag agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces, His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating His beams of light, love, and glory from His beloved Son. They would better understand how offensive in His sight is sin. Thus, the cross of Calvary proves that Satan and sin are the destroyer. Our Lord Jesus suffered the hiding of His Father's face. He suffered the wrath of God for us. The cross, therefore, confirms the truth that sin produces death by the separation from God. The cross proves that sin, whenever it is finished, produces death. The cross proves God right when He said that sin produces death. The cross proves Satan wrong when he asserted that sin does not cause death. The cross proves that we all have a genuine choice in the great conflict between light and darkness. 
If we choose righteousness, we are choosing eternal life. If we choose unrighteousness, we are choosing the second death, and it is sin itself which will destroy us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's Romans 6.23. Now God's name, His character, and His law are all one and the same. In 1 John 4.8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now I have come to understand that the law of God describes what our loving Father's uh, character is, and it gives us a definition of love. Now, if we disobey the commandments, consider this, if we disobey the commandments, if we steal or lie or kill, etc., we are not acting out of love. That's not what a loving person does. If we choose not to spend time with our Creator, we are not acting in love. <clears throat> if we claim to love someone, and we don't spend time with them, do we really love them? The commandments are only restrictive to those who love sin and fail to see the hedge of protection they provide from being less than a loving person. In Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, page 343, it is stated, These commandments are not grievous, God has given them for the good of His people. His law is the hedge which He has built around His vineyard for its protection. The Lord has plainly stated the laws of His kingdom and has declared that He will abundantly bless His people if they will obey them. It is their life to obey. In keeping God's commandments, there is great reward. End of quote. If we choose to act outside of love, we are breaking down a hedge that protects us. When we sin, we are separating ourselves from God. We are saying, we don't want you, depart from us, and placing ourselves upon the enemy's ground. Jesus did not say, if you love me, keep my commandments, that we may be held to some strict lifestyle and devoid of happiness and pleasure. He is saying this, that we may, that we may be more like him, that we may experience the agape love that He represents and gives to us, that we too may be one with Christ and the world may see Him in us. Join me for a, a quick closing prayer. Father in heaven, I just want to lift you up to all, all people and I want to turn hearts and minds to you, Father. For you are filled with goodness and love and protection. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your sacrifice for us. And we pray that you will please draw us closer, that we may walk closer to you, and that you will work through us, and that you may be seen in everything we do. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.